So welcome everybody to the first um, code seminar of, of the academic year. Um, thanks very much to Manuela Lachimaya today um, for kicking off our seminar series. Uh, Manuela is a research associate in the different departments of sociology here. Um, what we'll do is, is it roughly what, about 45 minutes? And we're going to speak for maybe 30 minutes. 30 minutes, so okay. Have space for the discussion. And then we have some, some space for um, some que for questions and, and, and response afterwards, so okay. okay. So if I leave it over to you now. Yes. Uh, okay, so hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this code seminar. So yeah, uh, my name is Manuela. I'm a research associate here at the University of Manchester. So I'm going to talk about uh, my research, which uh, centers the experiences and identities of French citizens of Indian descent. So in my research, I look at how these groups um, unsettle the categories that are used to discuss race in France. And I guess what that can tell us more broadly about racial formation, Frenchness, and racialized mobilization and resistance, so in the French context. So I'm going to start with an anecdote, which I think is illustrative of the official French narrative, but I'm also using it to set out the historical context and give some background information about uh, my participants. So a few months ago, uh, I met a very racist person at an academic gathering at Sandbar. Um, this person was doing a PhD in another discipline, and they had intimate connections with France. And although they were not French, by virtue of being white and having lived in France, they felt that it gave them the right to give me a lesson about what being French means. So they initiated the conversation by asking me about my ethnicity, and they also asked me about my research and they finally shouted um, in the pub, but why South Asians in France? I don't see a link between these two populations. So as this person had lived in France, um, the first thing I could notice was their ignorance uh, because Paris is the second European city with the biggest South Asian population after London. And I guess their ignorance also made me angry because my um, French colonialism in India had shaped so my family's uh, history migration trajectory, sense of loss and displacement, and endeavors to survive uh, in a system that oppressed them in both racialized but also classed ways. So although this history isn't very well known, um, it's not prominent in the academic literature about France, French colonialism in India started so with trade, um, I guess very much like Britain, so in this case with the French East India Company in the 17th century, uh, I won't get lost in historical details, but I can say more about this history, if you like, uh, in the discussion. But essentially, so there were a number of kind of European conflicts, mostly Franco-British in the 18th century, and the French eventually have, had to withdraw from India and most of South Asia, but they were able to keep so five enclaves, or in colonial terms, uh, French establishments in India. I just added some dots to the map to show where the establishments were because most other maps are very colonial. So I just took a screenshot of Google Maps and added dots where the establishments were, but they were mostly in Southern India and then with one in West Bengal. Um, so these places are the starting point of my research. Um, so the racist academic at Sunbar also asked me the question, which is my, in my case isn't, where are you really from, or where are you from from, but where in France are you from? For me, this is a very strange and quite difficult question to answer because my family's history doesn't fit within neat narratives of migration and being quote unquote, caught between two cultures. Of course, this idea of here and there, caught between cultures is problematic in itself, but I think that this person was expecting me to talk about what it meant to be both French and Indian and almost having two fixed and changing cultures. The problem is that my family, so multiple generations ago, they moved from these establishments to uh, Guadeloupe, which is a current French overseas territory in the Caribbean as indentured sugar workers. So indenture was essentially a new system of racialized exploitation um, that European colonial powers, mostly once again, the usual suspects, the French and the British, put in place to maintain um, the plantation economy and the sugar colony more specifically as a system productive of metropolitan wealth after the respective abolitions of um, slavery uh, in the Caribbean and elsewhere. 
So because slavery had by then become illegal, um, indenture was presented as a system of free labor. So this is a map of uh, indenture. Despite this frame, this very questionable frame of free labor, indenture did involve human trafficking, deceit, uh, and abuse in the place of arrival. For example, in Guadeloupe, uh, indentured workers were considered the property of white plantation owners upon arrival. So my family ended up set, uh, settling in Guadeloupe for a number of reasons, and they became French in 1924. So even if at the time Guadeloupe was uh, still a colony of France, indentured workers, they were able to strategically use the supposedly French principle of universalism and universal equality to demand citizenship. And this is because 76 years before that, in 1848, after the second and final abolition of slavery in uh, French colonies, formerly enslaved people uh, became citizens. So this wasn't a benevolent move. The French state had appropriated to so co-opted abolition once again as supposed evidence of its embrace of universal freedom. So my family became French, um, just like other indentured families and formerly enslaved families as well. Um, and in 1946, uh, Guadeloupe became an overseas department of France. So it didn't become an independent country. It became integrated uh, sort of into the French state apparatus. I think that those who are familiar with the works of Franz Fanon or Aimé Césaire, who came from Martinique, so another overseas territory in the Caribbean, might be familiar with this history of non-decolonization, or some argue that it's a form of non-traditional decolonization. Yeah. Um, so this person asked me where in France I was from, and so I explained that although I'm French, I'm not from, I guess, the geographical entity that people associate with France. So I'm not European French, but I'm still French in many ways, whether I like it or not. So because of these connections that the French empire created between India and the Caribbean, I'm French. Um, this person was also showing ignorance about another dynamic that was happening in parallel between India and hexagonal France. So I'm talking about hexagonal France, I guess, to account for the fact that there are French people, I guess, living in the overseas territories. So at the same time as indentured workers were leaving India, those who stayed in the establishments, so those who stayed in India, uh, were also becoming connected to other parts of the French empire via specific colonial policies. So for example, um, the French colonial administration introduced the surrender procedure in 1881. Um, so essentially through this policy, Indian men in the French establishments were able to acquire French citizenship. And in return, they had to convert to Catholicism adopt um, a French name. So essentially they had to assimilate it to dominant white French codes. And in return, they often had to join the French army uh, or the French colonial administration in India, but also in other former colonies like Algeria, former Indochina, Martinique, Djibouti, etc. So the French, the French state held on to these establishments for a really long time. Uh, it only left India in 1956, so nine years after the British, and when it left, uh, it offered citizenship to everyone in the establishments. Once again, this wasn't a benevolent move. The main target was the descendants of uh, white French colonizers and mixed race people who lived in the colonies. However, a lot of people who were ethnically Indian also became citizens via this policy. And um, this is what triggered a wave of mass migration from India to hexagonal France in the 1960s. So I guess we have these two groups who originated from the establishments. So one that became indentured in the Caribbean and elsewhere. So particularly in my research, so I'm looking at indo guadeloupians so people from Guadeloupe. And another group that stayed in India and was both oppressed by the French colonial system, but that also had a position of privilege um, in the French, um, in this kind of French colonial system. Um, as I said, a lot of uh, people from the establishments um, were, colonial administrators in Algeria, or they fought for the French in uh, decolonization wars, so for example, in Vietnam or in Algeria, but on the French side. So this is something that I kind of, I'm still thinking about in terms of power dynamics and privileges uh, in this stratified um, system. So this question, why South Asians in France, what's the link between these two? populations isn't a difficult question for me to answer given my personal trajectory, but it's one that most other French people wouldn't be able to answer. Uh, the French state itself has silenced these colonial entanglements, and this erasure is due 
to the small size of the establishments. And I guess there's smaller significance in the French Imperial project compared to uh, places like Haiti or Algeria. But I think it's also because the trajectory of the people I'm looking at doesn't fit within dominant narratives about French history and society. So for example, as I said, the French state has co-opted the abolition of slavery as evidence of its supposed embrace, uh, supposed embrace of universal freedom, but indenture deeply contradicts this idea of 1848 as the moment in which the French state embraced universal freedom. Although indenture was different from slavery, it was still a system based on race and racialized exploitation. The second narrative that uh, the groups I'm looking at destabilized is the idea that French society became multicultural after the Second World War, so through bilateral agreements between the state and former colonies, mostly in North and West Africa. Um, so I guess French people of Indian descent are among other groups that complicate this narrative of a white European French nation that became multicultural overnight. These people uh, became French under the French Empire way before uh, so-called post-colonial migration. So despite um, this colonial history and literature showing that the French nation state constructed itself to empire in both material and symbolic ways, so the French state in the present follows a policy of colorblindness. So I'm sorry if that's kind of obvious, but I feel like it's important to mention in this talk. So according to this colorblind ideal, uh, the French state only deals with individual citizens and not with groups, so it doesn't see race. Um, the only group identity that it recognizes is Frenchness, and according to this idea, all French citizens are equal before the law, and so they shouldn't express uh, sexual, ethnic, or religious identities in public. So doing so is seen as divisive, as bringing an almost separatist identity into the French public sphere and threatening the unity of Frenchness. We have seen in recent decades how this policy has been a mechanism to silence uh, French people of color, and in particular, French Muslims. So for example, laws uh, banning specific types of Muslim headwear in public spaces. In 2020, the government uh, ex explicitly attacked social scientists, particularly those working with critical race theory. Current president Emmanuel Macron said that race was a concept that we were importing from the US, that it was a uniquely American reality, and that only class was relevant to explain inequalities in France. And according to him, seeing race goes against the French idea that all human beings are equal regardless of particular attributes. So we can see how colorblindness and universalism are a way to assert the supremacy of whiteness under the pretense of neutrality. And one of the many ironies of colorblindness is that, as I mentioned in my introduction when I was talking about being French but not being from France, um, the French state to this day has colonies, so most of these people have the official status of overseas departments and regions of France. Um, people born there are citizens, French laws and administrative structures fully apply there, and you might be surprised, but these territories are represented in both the French parliament and the European parliament as well, so my parents vote for MEPs uh, in the European parliament. Most of these places have specific types of resources that the French state can um, extract and claim as its own. So for example, uh, Kanaki in the Pacific or New Caledonia is well known for its uh, nickel resources, French Guyana for its gold mines. Policing in the overseas territories is as heavy uh, as in the working class, mostly racialized uh, suburbs of Paris. Um, I just wanted to briefly show, so this is from Twitter. Uh, so this happened last week. So the French government sent a uh, French anti-riot police from Paris to Martinique to repress um, popular protests against the, against the high cost of living in the overseas departments. So essentially since the 17th century, there has been this policy whereby all the goods uh, in the overseas territories come from hexagonal France. So trade can only happen between hexagonal France and the overseas territories, which means that the cost of living is extremely high in these places. So on Sunday, so two days ago, Emmanuel Macron sent um, the French anti-riot police to Martinique. So this is, I guess, what's happening now in so-called France. Okay, so I'm going to say a bit more about the empirical material now, but I've lost my my slides. Uh, let's see. Okay. 
So as I said, my research looks at the ways in which uh, Indo-Europeans and so I call uh, people who came directly from India to France, non overseas Franco Indians. So I look at how these people create their identities in France and how they resist invisibility since, as I said, South Asians, sorry, no worries, oh, sorry. So South Asians generally and Indians specifically are invisible as a social group in France. Um, this research was conducting, uh, conducted during the COVID pandemic, so I wasn't able to do any uh, in-person research. So I was initially planning to spend some time in Paris conducting an ethnography of French South Asian activist groups and organizations to kind of understand the, mic the uh, macro dynamics of identity creation, kind of collective identity creation. And I then wanted to conduct more biographical interviews with uh, individual participants, so who had roots in Guadeloupe or in the establishments uh, to look at the role of micro processes and family histories. Uh, because of the pandemic, so I had to move the ethnography online uh, and use digital ethnographic methods, which was good in a way to grasp, I guess, the enmeshment between online and offline forms of activism, but that also significantly reduced uh, the role of place. So, for example, Paris as a significant, as a place that is significant in terms of uh, the emergence of a collective South Asian identity in France or on island like Guadeloupe to look at kind of contemporary forms of colonialism, uh, French colonialism in the Caribbean. Um, in terms of the individual, the individual interviews as well, recruiting online meant uh, that I only had access to a very specific demographic, so people that were aged between 18 uh, and 40. Um, and most of my participants were from working class backgrounds, but through specific state-sponsored schemes or scholarship programs, they had gone to university and had experienced social mobility. So it's a very specific demographic due to restrictions uh, in terms of recruitment during COVID. And now I'm just going to say more about so the findings and some of my thoughts. So I only selected a few aspects of the research for the purposes of this talk. The first um, point is perhaps unsurprising, but it's this question of Frenchness as whiteness. So the experiences of my participants really echoed that of other French racialized minorities in terms of experiencing forms of structural and interpersonal racism, of experiencing a disconnect between being citizens and having been embedded in French society and history for a long time and experiencing exclusion because they are not white. So when I'm talking about other French racialized minorities, so the um, minorities, I guess, that are considered as visible in France, but also in the literature are so people of North African descent, so of families who came from Algeria, Morocco and Tunisia, um, Sub-Saharan African people who came from former French colonies in West Africa, like Senegal or Mali, and also people from the Caribbean, but Black Caribbean groups. Um, so these are I guess, the most the visible groups, but my participants' experiences echoed uh, the experiences of these other groups. So for example, uh, participants specifically highlighted how obviously the French colorblind model doesn't work because it both pressures French people of color to assimilate into dominant white French codes, while at the same time marginalizing them and racializing them as non-white. Despite this idea of official colorblindness, participants mentioned proxies such as skin tone, accent, name, and place as factors that white people used to racialize them. So for example, um, Fabrice, whose parents came from, from Pondicherry, one of the establishments in the late 1980s, uh, he was telling me about growing up in Paris and about his experience in French society. And he said, um, I had done my best to integrate and to respect what I had been asked to do to be French and to be as French as one can be. And even I'd like to say even whiter than white people despite my very visible skin color. And he says, I had done everything but discrimination, inequalities, racism, upward mobility and missing opportunities. It was still very, very hard and I was seeing that something wasn't working. Something wasn't working, so I was wondering what had happened. I had done everything and I'm even, yeah, as French as one can be, whiter than white people. Um, in a similar way, Charlie, a participant who um, was born in the Paris region and whose parents came from Pondicherry but via Cambodia and Vietnam, said uh, specifically about primary school um, that I feel like I had to detach myself from my Indian cultural heritage. And maybe I started to perceive myself as more French than Indian and to perceive myself through this neutral eye associated with French universalism and integration through assimilation. And here, Charlie tells us a bit more about place and uh, accent, saying, I remember I was always scared to have an accent from the banlieue, so the Parisian suburbs, working class racialized suburbs. 
Uh, and he says, you know, like a council estate accent, I know this doesn't make much sense, but it was to make my social relationships, so generally with adults, so teachers easier, and so that white kids around me would perceive me in the same way that they perceive each other. And it's like I was trying to obtain a white passing, uh, even if given my physical appearance, it wasn't possible. So I guess we can see this idea that despite what the French colorblind model promises, so through assimilation, you can achieve equality, what participants are saying is that these different proxies such as skin tone, but here place, so I guess place and accent coded as race, do interact in shaping um, participants' experiences of marginalization and exclusion. Um, most of the Guadalupian participants that I worked with had migrated to France as young adults, so mostly through uh, scholarship programs to go to university. And so they experienced the shock that Franz Fanon wrote about. So that of being, well, Fanon was writing in the 1950s and now we're talking about people in 2024, but not much has changed. So they were talking about kind of being taught um, back in the Caribbean that they are French citizens, only to realize in the quote unquote mainland that they are considered as inferior citizens. So neither fully foreign, not fully French. So for example, Noor, uh, who moved to Paris to study literature on a scholarship says, uh, that she arrived in the real Paris, not the Paris um, of Instagram. And it was really, you study Victor Hugo and how French was written in the Middle Ages. And it's really not what I was, uh, what I had imagined. And that's when I realized that Paris is very, very white, the Paris I was imagining when I was 16. And she says that in the end, it's a very white Paris that is inaccessible because we can take photos in front of the Louvre Museum. But after these photos, what is there? Racism and feeling out of place. So here, I guess Lou indicated that these popular symbols of Frenchness, uh, such as French literature or famous museums, advance a version of Frenchness, a white version of Frenchness in which she's not included. Um, and she explained that she was sold um, another version of Frenchness as one that is inclusive. But when she moved to Paris, she realized that despite being a citizen, she couldn't fully uh, belong because she's not white. Other participants uh, mentioned language and colonial tropes about the Caribbean as shaping their experiences. So for example, uh, white French people praising them for their good level of French, even if French is their first language. Um, and very often their interlocutors had a colonial understanding of the French nation state, where Guadeloupe was included in understandings of Frenchness and they accepted participants as legal citizens but this was often conditional upon perceptions of Guadeloupe as a parent colony and participants as inferior members of the French national community and even in some interactions as uh, colonial subjects. So for example, Natalie uh, who moved to Paris, so she got offered a scholarship similar to widening participation uh, scholarships and programs in the UK. So she went to study social sciences and she was telling me about how in her first year of university, she gave a presentation and then this white French uh, man came to her and says and said, oh, so actually I didn't know that people in Guadeloupe knew how to express themselves so well. And she said, so I look at him and I say, can you please repeat, I didn't understand. And he says, yes, I didn't know people in Guadeloupe knew how to express themselves so well, but do you have schools over there? And so essentially she responded asking him, are you trying to tell me that I'm too intellectually stupid to be in this university? And this is something she really emphasized in the interview. She spoke about intellectual racism, which I guess is at the crossroads between biological and cultural racism um, with these different stereotypes about uh, the Caribbean. So yeah, so these findings are in line with the existing literature uh, that argues that whiteness uh, shapes dominant definitions of what being French means. And of course, whiteness others all racialized groups because my participants experiences are in line, as I said, with existing studies about French people of North African descent, but also black French people from both the Caribbean and um, Sub-Saharan Africa. At the same time, what distinguished my participants, I guess, in their experiences from other minority groups is that misidentification and misrecognition um, directly shaped their experiences. So because South Asians are invisible as a social group in France, so as I said, the only kind of racial categories that are in use are black, white, and North African. Once again, the state doesn't see color, but then when it suits, yeah, the government, they do see blackness and North Africanness in very problematic ways. And because of this invisibility of South Asians, 
So participants were often approached through existing categories, so blackness and North Africanness, or they were sometimes ambiguously racialized in proximity with these categories. So for example, Hassan, um, a participant whose parents came from Karaikal, an establishment via uh, Vietnam and Djibouti, and he works as an actor now and a professional dancer in Paris. So he says, um, nowadays, I'm telling you as a Tamil person in French society, so my job is easier because on TV, I'm the acceptable black man. I'm the black man with straight hair. Uh, I know why I'm more acceptable because in the collective imagination, because this was constructed since the 18th century, I'm submissive, I'm emasculated, and so they let me in, so they give him roles on public TV because in their heads, people think that this guy is rather cool, so he won't bother us. So what Hassan is saying is that Mainstream French society racializes him as black, but not quite. And he mentioned his straight hair um, as a marker that is used by his interlocutors to sort of highlight his ambiguity. So people can't really locate him within French uh, racial frames of reference. And he also says that French society perceives him as submissive and emasculated, and so as someone who won't be as resistive and questioning of, of power dynamics in the workplace compared to black French people. So he and his, he's referring to French and British colonial stereotypes about South Asians. So what this suggests is that Hassan is implicitly perceived as South Asian in France, but he's, un, he's unnamed in this way because dominant French society doesn't know and so cannot name uh, the category Indian or South Asian. And so it perceives Hassan through a known category in France, that of blackness, but in a very ambiguous way. And this was a theme that other participants spoke about. So other participants spoke about um, their skin tone being used as a proxy um, for blackness. And so very often that also shaped the, um, their experiences of racism in France. Uh, Guadalupean participants said that even though they were not directly misidentified as black, they were often uh, referred as black because um, I guess in France, Caribbean is understood as a synonym of black. And so whenever it came to housing or employment, um, the term black was used to refer to them. In related ways, uh, participants who mentioned being lighter skinned or uh, having Muslim sounding names were often misidentified as North African. And so essentially the main takeaway is that when they were made visible, that was often through other categories that are more established in France, but not through the categories that they use to define themselves necessarily. And so this invisibility and misidentification created a sense of wanting to create an identity that both resists racialized exclusion that stems from French state racism, but also to resist the invisibility of South Asians in French anti-racist circles and discourse or discourses about post-colonial French society and um, so-called diversity. So, as I said, I was interested in both the macro dynamics of collective identity creation, but also the micro narratives and family histories. And of course, there are connections uh, and intersections between these two dimensions. So for example, um, participants, so both those from collectives and organizations, but also individual participants, talk about a brown French identity that was in formation and the idea was to establish a South Asian presence in France and insert themselves within the French landscape and the French racialized uh, landscape more specifically. So this brown French identity was initially formulated by the collectives and activist groups that I worked with, but it was also endorsed by individual participants to various degrees. Uh, interestingly, most participants used the term brown in English, not in French, and that was a source of internal tensions so for example, some participants said that it made sense to use the term in English because the French equivalent of brown, uh, marron, echoes the history of transatlantic slavery, so they didn't want to appropriate terminology that doesn't apply to their histories. But others explained that uh, this was because, because South Asians are invisible in France, they had to look to other countries, mostly English-speaking countries, to find kind of the right words and tools to assert their presence in France. A lot of people mentioned um, kind of British Asian actors and artists, but in terms of race, so for example, Noor said that what made her become interested in questions of race, questions of, and then she said, because I think that they in English speaking countries are more advanced than us in France. And so even books about hair, so Emma Dabiri's book, Don't Touch My Hair, 
and reading more about Afra Hirsch, Akala, is what made her kind of want to reflect more on her experiences of racism. Sarah, uh, an activist from Mauritius, a Franco activist, um, Franco Mauritian activist, said that for her, this idea of a brown identity emerged when she started to read more about indenture and how essentially indenture happened in Mauritius, but it was also applied to places like Fiji, Guyana, and Trinidad. And so she says that this is when she started to develop a brown consciousness, like an articulate brown consciousness that kind of unites different uh, indentured groups. And for a lot of participants, this term brown was also helpful to emphasize, I guess, the internal diversity in terms of national origins, religions, and even citizenship statuses when it came to French South Asian, to South Asian people in France. So for example, Noor, so she's from Guadeloupe, so she was saying that I think we should have our own term, an umbrella term, because there are so many South Asian people, those from the overseas territories, from Mauritius. And then she says that South Asians too, in my opinion, it implies that I actually came from there, that my grandparents were born there. And so when I hear South Asian, it seems far removed from me because it doesn't include the Caribbean dimension. So I guess for her being brown is particularly helpful because she comes from the Caribbean and in the present doesn't have connections with India, no, in, no direct connections. Uh, Vazuda, a participant whose parents came from Pondicherry in the 1990s, also shared that idea that brown is an inclusive identity because it doesn't assume that all South Asian people are Indian or have a direct link with the subcontinent. And so she said that for her, a brown identity is larger than Indian because it can be people from Mauritius, Guadeloupe, or even Indian, but that have had a completely different life trajectory from a spiritual perspective. So she's, I think she was saying that as well because a lot of French South Asian people are Catholic, as I mentioned, because of these French colonial policies. And so she says that, uh, so yeah, that's what makes this brown identity so rich and extremely diverse, even if we have this strength of sharing the same roots. And so I guess through the research, I was able to see how the two groups sort of came together in hexagonal front and interacted and tried to create this broad identity. At the same time, this wasn't done in homogeneous or harmonious ways. Uh, it was an identity full of tensions. And some participants argued that using a term in English actually gave legitimacy to the French state's idea that race is an American concept uh, that doesn't apply in France. So for example, Hassan, he was talking about terminology about race in English more generally. And he said that I refuse to use words that come from the US to define myself. I'm not woke, so he said it in English. And he said, if I use this term, I've been woke for 22 years, I'm awake, conscious, since my dad subscribed to Corriere de National, so a French newspaper. And he said, I didn't wait for white people to use a word that comes from the US on TV to say that racism is an American problem. And he says, I don't use the word blackface, because he's an actor, so he was referring us to his line of work. And he says, I don't use the word blackface, I use the word barouillage because it's a French practice. So according to him, using terminology in English locates race outside of France and locates this South Asian identity outside of France and reproduces the very dynamic, I guess, that French Asian people are trying to resist. Uh, another participant, Fabrice, also said that, he said, I'm, we're talking about the word brown, and I have to say that I find this term quite problematic, even if I used it in his interview. And he says it's problematic because it's an anglicism that minimizes our social issues. At least it's the case with the terms black and noir. Why don't we say noir and we say black? Because it's more acceptable and it's more politically correct. So here he's talking about, again, this policy of colorblindness, because France or mainstream French society is in series, um, French people often say the word black in English instead of the French word noir to talk about black identities. Um, nowadays, in the French context, using this word black in English is considered a slur if it's not used by a black person. And so I guess what Fabrice is saying is that by using these words in English, black and brown, um, we are locating South Asian and black communities outside of France. And so we should use French terminology to assert a presence in France. Um, when I was talking about tensions, uh, other things that came up um, in kind of within kind of brown French circles are the fact that there were power dynamics within these circles, and particularly ideas around authenticity, purity, and who is more French or more Indian. So, for example, when I was interviewing Hassan, so as I said, his family came from Karaipal, an establishment in France, and he was telling me about how. Um, he used to make a distinction between so-called true Indians, so people like him who had a direct link with India, and then watered-down Indians, so people like me who 
um, come from the indentured diaspora. Other participants also spoke about hierarchies around Frenchness um, and proxies used for that were accent or clothing. So a lot of Caribbean participants said that in ground French events, they often felt excluded or singled out and considered less French than the ones who were born in um, hexagonal France. So yeah, so in terms of identity creation and resistance, I mean, I only mentioned this kind of brown French identity uh, for the purposes of this talk, but there were many other ways in which participants pushed back against racialized exclusion. This was done in big and small ways, in obvious and subtle ways. So for example, sometimes by refusing to engage uh, in conversations about race with white French people, or sometimes calling out French people about their ignorance and racism, and sometimes by using their Frenchness situationally. So of course, these identities are not fixed um, when it came to French identities. So some participants used their legal status as French citizens to demand equality in specific situations. So as I said, when it came to uh, housing, for example, or when being treated unequally, but in other instances, they would refuse um, to identify as French. So, so yeah, so this is a very specific aspect of the research. Um, yeah, so just a few words uh, to conclude. So I guess, yeah, why does it matter that these French groups of Indian descent destabilize uh, existing racial categories in France? I think that foregrounding these lesser known histories helps to show the fragility of official French discourses, historical ones, uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, historical discourses around so the co-optation of abolition as the supposed French embrace of universal freedom, the idea as well that France was this exclusively white European nation before the, 19, the late 1940s, when in fact these complex colonial policies across the French empire created these connections between different parts of the French empire. And so there have always been French people kind of living outside of France, but also using strategically these I supposed, supposedly French ideals of equality, universalism to demand uh, equality. I also think that looking at different ways of being French can further help to destabilize the rigid idea that Frenchness is whiteness, even though this is the dominant definition and a, a definition that has been created historically there are French people of color who transform this dominant narrative on a daily basis, and once again, in small and big ways. So yeah, this was just a collection of thoughts. As I said, I selected particular aspects of the research for this talk. Uh, I wish I could have better shown the complexity of my participants' lives and histories, but also I guess I tried to convey um, a few points. Uh, so yeah, if anything wasn't unclear, please let me know in the discussion, and please uh, don't hesitate to share your thoughts.